So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is John Servos, the Commercialization Education Coordinator for Fast Forward Medical Innovation. Um, today you are viewing FDA regulation of healthcare or health IT applications provided by Fast Forward Medical Innovation and the Office of Tech Transfer. Um, I'm joined today uh, by two individuals with extensive knowledge of FDA regulation and technology transfer in the health IT space. The first of which is Drew Bennett, who's here with me, um, a senior licensing specialist for software, mobile, and digital technologies at Tech Transfer. And the second, uh, you just heard from her, our primary speaker for this afternoon, Donna B. Tillman. Donna B. is a biomedical engineer with 17 years of regulatory experience at the FDA and two years of experience at Microsoft. As the former director of the FDA Office of Device Evaluation, she has broad expertise in medical device regulatory affairs as well as regulatory requirements for software. In her current position as a consultant with Biologics Consulting Group, she strives to help clients navigate the FDA regulatory process to increase the availability of safe and effective products. Uh, before I turn things over officially to Donna B, let me talk about a few housekeeping items. Uh, we encourage you to ask or add comments throughout the webinar by using the text chat window that can be found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, your mic is automatically muted, so you will need to use this chat feature if you would like to communicate a question. Please be sure to check out some of the additional resources listed in the notes section on your screen, including some upcoming webinars and live events offered by Fast Forward Medical Innovation. And then finally, today's webinar is being recorded, so you can receive a link or you will receive a link uh, to the recording in a follow-up email that will be combined with the program evaluation. So I think with that, we are ready to begin, and I'm going to turn things over to Donna B. So thanks for that great introduction. Um, all right, so why is my computer? There we go. Uh, I'm going to start off with um, a, a brief introduction to how FDA regulates medical devices in general before I get into FDA regulation of software. Uh, this will be sort of a quick and dirty run through things uh, and I may make some some slight generalizations uh, so if anybody there is a real expert uh, please pardon I'm just trying to get the basic concepts across okay excellent uh, we, we're now seeing the definition of a medical device uh, and a definition of a medical device as I as I was mentioning before is a fairly broad definition and it includes um, an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent. So pretty much any kind of a widget or a thing that you can imagine that's intended to be used to diagnose, uh, cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent disease, or to alter the structure or function of the body for a medical purpose, which does not achieve its primary intended purpose through chemical action. So a device is basically something that is intended to be used uh, to manage uh, and to treat patients or, or alter the structure or function for something like a breast implant, but which is not a drug. Uh, so I think that's kind of an interesting definition in that um, it's a definition of exclusion. So given that we have this, this definition that encompasses all kinds of things that can meet the definition of a device, FDA and Congress uh, had to come up with an approach that would allow them to successfully regulate things ranging from tongue depressors and toothbrushes all the way up to um, heart valves and very high risk devices. And so the the way the FDA does that is it takes a risk-based approach where it, it tries to balance probable benefits to health from probable to probable risks of injury. So the greater the benefit, the more risk that FDA is willing to take and the greater the risk, the greater the level of oversight. Uh, FDA has established these classifications for approximately 1,700 different kinds of devices. And I like to think about these as sort of buckets. And these are the buckets that different kinds of devices get put into. For electrocardiogram is a bucket. Uh, endotracheal tube is a bucket. Um, blood pressure, a non-invasive blood pressure device is a bucket. And so those are the ways in which FDA approaches medical devices is it puts them into these generic buckets and then it determines uh, how they're going to, how it's going to regulate it. And there are basically three different classes that are assigned to medical devices based on their risk and based on how much control FDA thinks it needs to exercise over those devices in order to ensure their safety and effectiveness. On this slide, I just show you sort of an example of the, um, what is this thing here, of the wide range of medical devices. And in the upper left-hand corner here, we have some lower-risk devices like thermometers, toothbrushes, manual surgical instruments. 
Uh, and then in this lower right corner, we have the highest risk devices, which are class three, things like heart valves and pacemakers, um, uh, stents, intraocular lenses. And then in the middle, we have really what is the vast majority of medical devices. And those are the class two devices. And those are things like glucose test strips, uh, monitoring devices, contact lenses, gloves, uh, things you might not realize are medical devices like tampons and condoms, um, MRI machines, electrodes. So, um, you know, you've got this, as I mentioned, this really wide range of devices and, and the different devices are assigned to different classifications. Now, depending on the class of the device, that determines what kind of pre-market review that FDA is going to require for that device type. Uh, the lowest risk devices, which are in class one, are generally exempt from any kind of pre-market review. Um, there's, there's a few exceptions, but by and large, if you're a class one device, you're not subject to any kind of FDA pre-market review. Now, that doesn't mean that there's nothing you need to do. There's some other things you have to do. But um, this means that you don't have to go and get FDA to clear or approve your device before you market it. The second uh, class is class two devices. And as I mentioned, this is the vast majority of devices out there. And they require something called a 510K pre-market notification submission. And I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about what that means in just a second. And then the devices that are the highest risk or the most novel uh, are class three, and they require something called a pre-market approval application or a PMA. Or if they're intended for a small patient population, they um, can go to market through something called a humanitarian device exemption. So 510K is the pathway that most people who are developing new medical devices are likely to run into. And it is the pathway that requires you to identify a predicate device, which is a legally marketed device, and show that your new device is substantially equivalent. So that's, that's what you need to do. And, and it's kind of interesting because what I find is a lot of my clients and a lot of people developing new devices, they want to say, oh, my device is novel and it's new and there's nothing else like that out there. Well, that is absolutely not what you want to tell FDA because you want to be able to say to FDA, well, yes, even though I may have some new features or a slightly different technology, it's still substantially equivalent to what's already out there because that's what enables you to go through this 510K pathway, which is a lot less costly and expensive and burdensome than going down the, the PMA pathway. So in order to be a 510K, as I mentioned, you have to identify a predicate device, which is the device you're going to compare your device to. And on this slide, um, I show some of the criteria you, you, that can be used to identify a predicate device. It, it basically has to be something that's currently legally marketed. Oh, and by the way, um, I will, I'm happy to provide a copy of my slides um, when I'm done, electronic copy, and so um, if anybody wants a copy of the slides, you're welcome to have them. So don't feel like you need to go furiously writing, writing all of this down. So how do you determine, how does FDA determine that a new device is substantially equivalent to a predicate device? Well, first of all, it has to have the same intended use. Uh, so for example, let's say that you've developed a novel approach to um, monitoring a electrocardiogram and instead of using a uh, set of leads that measure the electrical activity from the heart from the, the surface leads that your new device is going to use ultrasound energy uh, and use that to determine the, the ECG and you're going to do something completely novel. Well that device has the same intended use as the predicate so so as current electrocardiograms and so they could potentially be a predicate device. The next question FDA then asks is, okay, it's got the same intended use. Does it have the same technological characteristics? Well, in the example that I've given, I would say no, because using ultrasound energy is very different than using a surface electrode to measure electrical activity. And so it doesn't have the same technological characteristics. Well, that's still okay, because a new device could have different technological characteristics as long as those differences do not raise new questions of safety and effectiveness. And so what FDA would be saying is, you know, is there, are there new types of questions that using um, ultrasound energy to measure the electrical activity of the heart raise over, over using the traditional way? And my sense is they might say yes in that case. They might say there are differences, and in which case it could not be a 510K. Uh, so, but if, if the answer was yes, that there, 
was that there were no differences, then FDA would allow you to basically provide bench data showing, showing that your device could measure the ECG waveform uh, comparably to the current device. And, and then that would be the basis for demonstrating substantial equivalence. So this is a somewhat sort of esoteric process that you have to go through. I mean, fundamentally, uh, it's really about trying to find a device that's as similar to yours as possible. Um, FDA has kind of strict requirements about what you need to put in your 510K. There is actually a user fee, uh, which is a, right now about $5,000 for a 510K, and it's half that if you're a small business. You have to submit it both in paper and using FDA's electronic copy program, which requires a certain format. And then FDA will uh, try to review your 510K within 90 total days. They may came, come back to you and ask additional questions. Uh, and when they do that, their clock stops, and then the 90 days starts again. My experience is that once you get a 510K submitted, it generally takes between four to eight months for FDA to finish its review of the device. And it really depends on how complex the situation is and how good a job you did and how different your device is from the predicate device. Now, I mentioned the little scenario I gave. What if your device is not substantially equivalent? And what if it's, you know, you've got a new technology, but it really isn't something that is so high risk that it really should be a PMA? And FDA has a program called the de novo program, which basically says, well, if somebody comes up with a new type of device, we're going to create a new bucket for it. And that's this de novo classification process. And at the bottom of the slide, I've given some examples of some recent devices that have gone through this pathway. Um, there's a colon capsule imaging system where you swallow this thing, and it takes images of your GI system as it passes through it, um, a foot wrap for restless leg syndrome, um, actually using um, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation for migraine headaches. Uh, that was a, a de novo as well cooling devices to remove fat deposits. So these are devices that are low to moderate risk for which the kinds of questions and the data you need are generally well understood and they can go through this de novo regulatory pathway. Then the, the, the sort of longest path to market, and this is an area where if you get into the PMA uh, into a PMA, you're looking at a total development cycle time of probably four to eight years. And you know the, the numbers that I hear out there are 50 to $200 million. So obviously, if you're going to go down this road, you're going to need to be able to raise some significant amount of capital. Uh, and you, know, you need to be prepared that it's going to be a long road. Um, this is almost, it's not quite as hard as getting a new drug approved, but it's, it's up there in terms of complexity. And then for a PMA, what you have to show is a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. Uh, and this usually uh, almost always require you to do a clinical, a clinical trial. Um, mostly these are randomized controlled clinical trials, although not always. Uh, and you know, this is a fairly, as I mentioned, a fairly long process. Um, a sort of typical pathway for a PMA device is that you would develop your new device. Um, you'd do some bench testing and proof of concept. Uh, and you would you know, basically show that your device do did what you say it did. And at that point in time, you'd probably go out for your first round of trying to get some capital uh, to get some money that would enable you to go and do your first in human studies. Um, usually, these first in human studies historically have actually not been done in the US because it's, it's FDA has to approve approve them before they're going to let you study them in the U.S. and it can be very difficult. FDA is trying to get companies to do their first in human studies in the U.S. Um, but, you know, it, it, as I said, a lot of people do those outside of the U.S. Once you've finished your first in human study and actually have, you know, the sort of next level of evidence, you're going to need to go out and raise more money. Uh, and that's when you need to come and talk to FDA about what, the, what your pivotal study is going to look like, what kind of clinical trial you're going to do. Um, and then, you know, you go out and execute your clinical trial, you'll prepare your PMA submission, uh, you'll, and you'll submit it to FDA, um, your PMA to FDA. And um, then FDA's review time frames for PMAs, you know, my experience is one to two years usually for the review process for a PMA. So this is, this is a long road to go down. Now, if you have a device that is intended 
that is a PMA device, it is a class 3 device, but it's only for a disease or condition that affects fewer than 4,000 people a year, then you can do a humanitarian device exemption. And instead of showing uh, reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness, you have to show that probable benefit exceeds probable risk. And this is a slightly lower bar. Uh, and you know the downside to these devices is obviously you can have a much smaller market because you only have fewer than 4,000 uh, people per year. They have to be used under an institutional review board supervision. Uh, and there's some limitations about how much in terms of what kind of cost you can recoup. Um, on this slide, I put a couple of examples of some uh, devices that have gone through this pathway. So that's sort of the pre-market the, the pre market considerations for devices, but that's not the whole picture. Uh, in addition to being able, needing to get FDA to approve your submission or clear your 510K, you have to implement a quality system. Um, so these are the other things you have to do if you actually decide you're going to be a medical device manufacturer. You have to report adverse events. You have to register and list with FDA. There's rules about what you can say in terms of what kinds of statements you can make and when you advertise or promote your product. You have to develop labeling. And so there's, there's a, a significant amount of additional work you have to do if you're actually going to um, get into the business of being a medical device manufacturer. And for these reasons, a lot of companies end up deciding to license their technology uh, instead. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these exit strategies at the end of my talk. So that's sort of the general intro to medical device regulations.